Are you getting a red? Oh. What? I get it. On how to organize this YouTube playlist. Oh, 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 oh. I get it. <laughs> Got it. I was like trying to use channels and I was like, just make a playlist. Just yeah. make different playlists with classes. And I was like, ah, it seems simple. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it's just like, I didn't just write it, just make a playlist. But I wrote like, make a playlist, then you don't have to manage multiple channels. Sincerely. Hey, it's just. When people say like Jessica and I answer Jessica, they get so taken aback. It's really funny. <laughs> like yesterday, someone was like, "Hey Jessica," and I was like, "Jessica," and they just looked at me and they're like, "Yeah." Under a lot of stress. <laughs> No, no, no. It's, it's, it's like not a mess. It's, it's not a mess, but just a mess. <laughs> yeah. It is. If someone's like, hey, Noah, instead of saying, like, yes, you gotta go, like, whoa, like, Yoa. Like, it's like, yeah. Yoa. Hey, Noah. Yoa? It doesn't work. It's not, not ideal. Effective. It's not ideal. People say just and I say yes. Just and yes. You go to church. <laughs> Thankfully, we can be spared from that one. <laughs> the one time I went to church, I, was, I just feel like I wasn't cut out for it. I'm a Jew. Oh. I, <laughs> but, like, not even practicing. And so I feel very strange in places of worship because I'm so scared of that thing. Okay, good morning everyone. Hi, nice. Welcome back. Okay, so. Using this week to try and get the back up on track. Just to quickly wrap up our. A couple of things, but just quickly wrap up of where we got to last week. Um, so last week was primarily exploring the first law of thermodynamics, energy conservation, if you will. Um, conceptually, fairly simple. Um, and then we have to worry about various special cases um, in the various terms which fall into the first law expression, which is up on the chalkboard behind me. Transition topic today. Hope you're well. Uh, so there it is. Um, I'll quickly recap on some of the special cases, but I um, want to come back and round out on two things, um, which were in those three pages of notes that I posted um, at the end of the class on Thursday, namely to quickly, um, for ideal gases, which is pretty much the only thing we're going to worry about, determine the relationship between um, specific heats at constant volume and constant pressure, and that is a simple relationship for ideal gases. So quickly introduce that, and then spend maybe 10 minutes or so talking about the last special case type of process that we may be interested in, so-called adiabatic process, where um, we're not transmitting uh, sort of heat energy or thermal energy. I will try, I think, depending on how things are looking time-wise, to go through a sort of um, semi-revolved quick example, and then we're going to turn our attention to a new topic, which will actually be the start of the rest of the semester material, namely electric statics. I'm hoping to get through all of uh, all of that this morning. Okay, so I uh, don't think I have any other announcements, so let's jump in straight off the bat. And again, just some quick recaps, and then we'll introduce the relationship between CP and CV. So some special cases that we learned about last week. You had some practice on in the last week's homework. So there's the adiabatic case, the one we're going to explore in a little more depth today. And this is when dq equals zero. And of course, that tells me now that the u equals minus dw. The constant volume scenario means no work is done, and therefore I can write, um, well in this 
convex, I can write that du equals cq, but also I can write that this is a constant volume, so I'm going to make this a constant volume. I'm going to write this as ncbt, again, all of each pass will be a constant volume. Again, a little bit of a lead into what we're about to derive, the constant pressure scenario. So in this case, I'm going to write this as U equals EQ <coughs> constant pressure minus EW, which is to say I can write this as NCP dt, constant pressure, minus P dv. This is a constant, so there's no explicit integral in that. And then kind of at the end. A closed cycle, and this tells us that du equals zero, and therefore q equals dw. And one last comment, footnote on here. What we learned about disorders along the way is that u is a function of t only, so it's what's called a state variable. And only depends on T. Or if you like, I can, for my ideal gas equation, go back and um, say that since I've got this, in this case, if it's only a function of T, I can, in other words, since I have an R or constant, I can say that it's only a function of the product of P and V. Okay? So it's not so useful for us to express it in those terms, but let me just write this here. That uh, u is a function explicitly of p times v, and that means the product of these only. But really, we only care about this being a function of temperature. Yeah? Um, what's the adiabatic equation for work? So we're about to derive it. Oh. Okay, so that's the thing that I just want to spend a little bit of time on. Yeah. Um, what's the point constant volume of u is equal to what? du equals dq. And the subscript there with a V denoting constant volume. Okay. Well, you'll also see um, once I post my notes from today's class, and I'll try and put these in a concise format on a formula sheet to become of relevance in the next couple of days as we start talking about next Thursday. I'm going to try and put some summary expressions on there. I don't want to give you everything, um, but at the same time, there's a lot of sort of stuff going on here, and just sort of having to remember things is not super useful. And in general, unless I'm asking you to explicitly derive something, I don't want you to remember these things. So I'm going to give you a kind of cheat sheet, and I've given a summary table in the notes that I'm going to post um, after class today, which will kind of be very much like what you'll expect to see on, a, on an exam formula sheet. Okay, so let me just quickly do this relationship between um, constant pressure, constant volume, molar heat capacities, and again, ideal gas equations. So we're looking at this specifically for ideal gases. So relating Cp and Cb for ideal gases. Okay, so U over here somewhere equals NCB dt for my constant volume scenario. Exactly what we have on the left hand side. But I can also write that the U, and this is for ideal gas, NCP dt minus P dv. This is constant pressure. Uh, let's see. So this is fine. P dV, I'm going to recast this by making explicit use of my ideal gas equation over there. And I'm going to write this as nR dT. Okay? okay, that's fine. That's P dV over here, I'm just replacing it by this, and I'm saying I can now pass this as nR dT. So I'm going to do so. So, okay, let me write this explicitly because it'll just make the 
relationship a little clearer. So now I've got this and this. And I'm going to relate these two things together because, of course, they're both changes in the same quantity, namely the internal energy. And I'm left with NCVT equals this. Okay? So, simple relationship with our definitions of the particular cases over on the left hand side, ideal cases. <coughs> This substitution, again, I do gas specific, and of course a bunch of things rather trivially cancel out. And I'm left with, with a little bit of manipulation here. That relationship for ideal gases. Okay? It's very simple, but kind of useful. It tells us now this relationship between molar heat capacity more specific heat capacity at constant volume, more specific, specific heat at constant pressure, and they differ simply by um, R. Okay? Now, just a quick throwback to last week. You'll remember we started off talking about monatomic gases, where this is comprised solely of three degrees of translational freedom. <coughs> and so we can write this as three halves R for monatomic ideal gases. Then we introduce the complexity for diatomic gases that this could, depending on the temperature and the energy available, this could increase beyond 3 halves R to 5 halves R if we include um, rotational degrees of freedom, and then 7 halves R if we include uh, vibrational degrees of freedom. So 3 halves, 5 halves, 7 halves R, depending on temperature for an ideal diatomic gas. And in every case, if I'm interested in the molar heat capacity at constant pressure, I'm going to add R to those values, okay? So again, just let that sink in a little bit. The last thing I'm going to do here, and this will be relevant for us when we introduce our last topic, which is the adiabatic processes, is for convenience, it's sometimes useful to define a new parameter, triple equality, which I occasionally use to define as a definition, and it's the definition of CP over CV. Again, for us, almost always ideal gases. Think about this, this is always greater than 1, and you can start to see some common uh, numbers which are going to appear out of this. So for an ideal monatomic gas, so this would be 5 halves over 3 halves, or 5 thirds. So for an ideal monatomic gas, this would be 1.67 roughly. Okay, that's Poorly written, I apologize. Ideal monotonic gas. And so you'll see this gamma parameter is shorthand for this ratio. That's pretty much what we need. Okay? So um, the relationship between CV and CP, the introduction of the gamma factor, and again for us, there are just a couple of um, sort of numbers which we're going to see quite commonly. All right, so let me move straight along and then I'll pause and ask for questions. And I specifically want to look at the adiabatic processes. They're fairly common. And we need some specific um, terms to work with that. We've done this already with an advance because I screwed up the synchronicity of the homework and the lecture. But we're getting back on track. So let me just quickly, I'm not going to derive these. Derivation is not something I'm going to ask you to do. It's not a bad idea to work through them once on your own. And again, it's the result that for us is important. Okay. So, let's see. Reminder. Expanding my gas in some way, what can you say about DW? 
positive. Okay. So the W is positive. Therefore, the U is negative. And since U is purely a function of temperature, dt, or if I want to make it explicit in terms of a finite chain, the temperature is going to drop. Okay. So adiabatic expansion, we expect the temperature to drop. Conversely, if I've got a compression, everything flips. And we expect a temperature rise. Okay, so simple qualitative arguments. And then the thing that I'm not going to go through in class is actually the derivation of um, a couple of results. So, some derivation here. Again, not a bad idea to walk yourself through it once, but then once you've convinced yourself you understand at least the basis of it, just worry about the results. What we find are two important relationships. Firstly, the PV to this power gamma of the newly defined variable, ratio of CP over CV, constant. And then secondly, the other relationship, which is T times V, turns out to be power gamma of minus 1, is also a constant. Okay. So those are two rather useful expressions specifically for adiabatic ideal gas processes. And there's a little bit of algebra um, involved, obviously. Problems where you're man 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 manipulating variables with this, but you're not being too troublesome with those power factors. And so that's one of the um, sort of two key results that you're going to use. And then to respond to the question that was asked five minutes ago about what about the work associated with an adiabatic process, again, I will not take your time with doing the derivation. Important. 
Now, in terms of remembering which particular equations, um, again, there's not much value for me in remembering them. I'm just going to make it clear on a lookup sheet which ones are relevant. And so for you, it's picking those and working with them. Obviously, a lot of the problems, and including the one that I'm hopefully just going to give you to work through, have multi-steps involved in them. And so it's not a bad idea as you're working through a multi-step process to kind of tabulate this in terms of step <coughs> one, step two, step three. What type of process is it? Maybe tabulate that and then maybe pick out from your memory or from more likely from the formula sheet guiding equations and try and piece those bits together. Obviously different uh, pieces of information might be missing from the various steps. And at the end of the day, most likely what you're going to be doing is kind of doing a, an overall budget keeping, if you will, in terms of du equals dq minus dw, okay? And again, it's not a bad idea to kind of even do this in a sort of somewhat uh, table form. You can write each of these quantities for each of the steps, fill in what you know, or you've been able to calculate if there's something you don't know, maybe you leave a blank or a question mark, and again, at the end, you're going to be doing a total budgeting here and then working those pieces together to figure out what is the target variable that you're missing. So I know it can be a lot of things going on in quick succession. It can be confusing because a lot of this came in quick succession. Um, but for me, a sort of systematic or keeping way, whatever works for you, is your best way towards succeeding in these various types of problems. So um, let me just then wrap up with the isothermal case, and then I'm going to pause and we'll do this quick problem, I think, and then we'll maybe turn our attention to the new topic. All of this stuff is adiabatic. Uh, I guess I can get rid of this. This was just kind of a footnote along the way. And then lastly, for an isothermal process, derivation, perhaps one that I might ask you, but trivial to figure out. The final over the initial, this is now the expression you can derive from our simple definition of work done. Plug in our ideal gas equation, and you can determine that the work done for an isothermal process is, has its logarithmic dependence on the volume change. Okay?
Okay, so this question. Uh, what is the change in the internal energy? So let me just write this as U. Uh, does it increase or decrease? That's part of this question. Um, and I guess that is all we've got. Okay, so um, I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay, just before I give you maybe three or four minutes to work on that with a neighbor, um, questions just before we get started on that. Yes? Uh, no. Okay. Take three or four minutes, talk to a neighbor, please talk to a neighbor, it's good practice, and then we'll quickly work it's through cool. it. And we'll turn our attention to the main topic. Yeah, and then you can turn. Yeah. You know it, but you know it. It's so our TI is precisely approximately. <laughs> Oh, you win if you can tell me how many Pascals it is. Uh, you don't need to know that. You just need to know that 0.0821 is the... Five. What? Okay. People told me things at once. Okay. No, you don't need to know that because I don't know doing, the other R. No, if you're do, it's 0.0821. Do you want to leave your up first? Sorry, I actually do want you to assume it's idiopathic. I've got it. So we just need to find your